Hi, I'm Mark Rosenthal. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at HQO. And with me today is Chase Garbarino, our CEO. Um, quick story to, uh, to start. Uh, as we think about development of commercial real estate and the application of data and technology, um, we were thinking about quick serve restaurants and specifically McDonald's and Burger King. I was driving the other day and uh, drove by the McDonald's right across the street from the Burger King, which is a pretty common, uh, pretty common situation in, uh, in the world. And it struck me that the differentiation between McDonald's and Burger King is really narrow, right? They're about 90% in the same business. They serve the same market. They serve the same customers. They serve more or less the same food. So why do they put themselves right across the street from each other? And how do they differentiate with, uh, with their outreach to customers? And it's really data that helps them to drive that. In quick serve restaurants, they have things like the flavor of the food. So McDonald's has their secret sauce for the Big Mac and Burger King has their sauce for the Whopper. They differentiate in efficiency and how fast they can get people through their drive throughs And they use data to, to, to look at all of this stuff. And in commercial real estate, what, what we believe is that differentiation is, is the same. It's in that last 10%. Buildings are more or less the same. Landlords are more or less going after the same markets. And it's that last 10% of differentiation that really, uh, that, that really plays a factor in how you lease up and how you retain your, your tenants and really create value. And so our point of view and what we'll talk about today is that if you're not combining data about your building, the systems and the users, then you're already behind in the industry. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of data, the HQO, the launch of HQOS and the digital grid and that under, and, and how you can use that data to understand the new set of value drivers for, uh, for commercial real estate. So with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll jump in and talk about Chase, maybe how data is valuable in, in every industry. Yeah. I mean, we've, we talk with, clients and prospects all the time about how um, digital technologies have brought uh, lots of different industries closer to the end user of their product. And typically what we've seen is the groups that do this really well are not necessarily the incumbents that were once dominant in a space that kind of nailed the innovator's dilemma on shifting from an old model to a new model, which we've seen time and time again is very hard. And there's a reason that the, the average life cycle of a Fortune 500 company is the shortest as it's ever been. And it's because technology is changing business so rapidly, it's kind of hard to manage these, these different innovation curves, if you will. But you know, one example that I think is really interesting is when you think about the music industry and what happened, you know, for a very long time, you had these dominant record labels uh, and large companies that controlled distribution like Clear Channel uh, in the 1990s, one of the best performing public stocks uh, that owned obviously a lot of radio licenses. And in 2006, a tiny little company was started in Stockholm, Sweden, which is not necessarily where you think of the epicenter of the American music uh, industry, a little company called Spotify. And you know, what, what Spotify was doing at the time was they were uh, one of the first streaming companies that are coming off of the heels of what Napster did, which was much more peer-to-peer -peer, um, music sharing. But today, Spotify has over 130 million paid subscribers. Uh, and obviously, they're a, they're a household brand. and you know, what we've seen is the old way that companies used to really dominate industries was you controlled a limited amount of supply. When you think about the record labels, you had executives that had a good year for picking the next uh, song and then they kind of jammed it on the consumers by, you know, there's a limited amount of songs that we could hear on the radio. And now what's fascinating to see when you look at how, the, you know, what has happened with Spotify, they have such granular data on your listening preferences. They know not only what you, Mark Rosenthal, like uh, in terms of all that Taylor Swift that I know you're listening to, um, but they know the types of melodies, the types of beats, 
the types of genres that are going to be popular and they can start to inform there's this you know continuous feedback loop on that how they inform what music they promote to drive new subscribers but also they've changed how music is made right so you have these emerging artists that study patterns and data of what types of music are popular and you have uh one example is a guy named Milo Stokes who runs Create Music Group, and he used data to figure out what collaborations with other artists were needed to help get a rapper called Trippy Red off the ground. And he very cost efficiently grew grew his following through studying what what types of artists he should he should collaborate with and grow grow his listener base. So you know whether it's music, whether it's commercial real estate, really any industry. You know it's happened in books with Amazon. It's happened with Netflix and in TV and movies, and now Disney Plus is one of the good examples of someone who's kind of managed that innovator's dilemma. But what we're seeing is there's this virtuous feedback loop where um, when you have some intelligence on the end user of your product, you're able to create a better user experience for them. When you create a better user experience from them, you get more customer engagement. More customer engagement gives you more data, which gives you more intelligence, which helps you create a better user experience. And this is something that we've seen just like interest. And I know a lot of our audience listening to this are investors, you know, interest compounds. And what we're seeing is winners in industries moving forward, understand that data and intelligence compounds. So when you think about compounding interest, the, the interest that you need to compound with data and intelligence has, it started yesterday, right? So to your original point of, if you're not doing this, you're already behind. Um, I don't think there's a greater urgency uh, in almost any industry, particularly what we've seen with COVID, um, to really start to collect data. And even if you can't immediately get the ROI out of it, um, if you're looking back, say in 24 to 36 months, you know, it's, it's like developing a muscle in sports, right? Like you have to start to practice and the returns don't come linearly. You know, you're flat and then you see these, these large jumps. So I think in terms of collecting data and learning how to use it to be actionable on what you're doing is really, really critical in any industry. Yeah, you know, you talked about sort of the compounding benefits or the compounding interest of data. And another company that's done that really well is Amazon, right? And I had the chance to hear uh, to hear a talk from one of the guys, the guy who actually holds the patent on the Amazon recommendation engine, right? So you think back to when Amazon first started selling books and all the compounding interest that they've had over the years developing additional additional retail. And they did that largely through the recommendation engine, right? If you bought this, you might like this. And that recommendation engine has gotten more and more powerful as Amazon has gotten more and more data. So what started as, you know, these are similar products or these are complementary products. And because you bought this one, you might also like this one today has evolved into, you know, looking at data from consumer behavior outside of your outside of your own, right? So an algorithm that looks at your purchase behavior, your purchase frequency, other users that are like you, other users that are not like you, and really fine tuning that algorithm to make Amazon the largest e-commerce retailer on the planet, right? And so what was really interesting about this, this conversation with this guy, David Liu, who holds the patent for the recommendation engine is that he's no longer at Amazon. He left Amazon, went back to med school, got his, uh, got his degree, and now works at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and is developing a predictive model for, uh, for detecting and then treating cancer, right? So taking that, same, taking that same sort of behavioral analysis, predictive analytics, computational biology, uh, you know, sort of a, approach that he used to build the recommendation engine for Amazon and applying it to, to treating cancer, right? It was so fascinating to listen to him sort of like, tell this story and really hear that it's all rooted in the data that they have available. And, and it's exactly that point that you made, right? That compounding interest of, uh, of data and the more of it they have, the, the more effective they can, uh, they can deliver a solution, right? I'm glad to hear that David is using his talents for good versus evil. It's better to uh, 
solve for cancer than to continue to fleece me on Amazon because that recommendation engine, I continually, you know, oh, I'll add that to the basket, I'll add that to the basket. Yeah, yeah. You're good at the upsell. That's right, that's right. So, I mean, that, so those are a couple examples of data, you know, data being valuable in sort of a broad set of industries, but we're also seeing now data is valuable for the physical environment as well. You were telling me about um, uh, some of the reading that you did in Atomic Habits. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, I just finished up the book. It's a great book about you know both developing good habits and certain techniques and all the research behind people who are effectively develop good habits and also broken bad habits. And one of the fascinating parts of the book is um, the the author really goes into how much uh, your environment matters. And obviously, you know, we're, you know, we have a vested interest in uh, the office environment uh, being necessary and a, a something that can companies continue to pay for um, since we, you know, our, our customers are uh, commercial real estate owners. Um, but we, we do it because we believe in it, right? And I, what I thought was so interesting about Atomic Habits was there is this quantifiable research proving how much environment matters. And um, I think for too long, our industry, when you think about commercial office space, the it's just assumed that you need an office in order to do work so when you think about the leasing tour it's not necessarily are you in market for product or not it's well of course you're in market for product which you know we come from selling software which is it's not inevitable that someone's necessarily going to buy software so we have to first figure out how we sell the category and then differentiate when they're sold on the category you know why why buy us and i don't think office owners have had to deal with that for quite some time now with flexibility and remote work, there is going to be a challenge to, you know, what's the ROI on office space. And one of the, the fascinating studies in the book is they followed a doctor at MGH who said, you know, motivation is overrated, environment matters more. And what she wanted to prove was that just by changing the environment in the cafeteria and never speaking to anybody at MGH, that she could decrease the consumption of soda and increase the consumption of water. And what she did was, you know, a lot of techniques that have been around in retail for a while. If you make some things convenient, other things inconvenient. If you make some things attractive, some things inattractive, unattractive, it's easy to change people's behavior. So within a mere 90 days, she was able to decrease soda consumption 11.4% and increase water sales 25.8% by changing the environment of the cafeteria. And this was so compelling to me because when you think about, you know, now that we've all been, you know, the majority of us have been working from home, you start to really think about the pros and cons of the office environment. And I think, you know, when you think about, um, social uh, behavior, we're very, obviously we're a very social species. You know, we tend to um, fit in with the crowd, right? So depending on the conduct and the culture at the office, obviously that's important. But when you think about the office environment and design, if you want to encourage more sales calls or more collaboration, more um, certain types of communication within office, environment is going to have a really powerful impact on that. And I think that's really good news for commercial real estate groups. Uh, in terms of the long-term prospects. And I know a lot of commercial real estate groups are not particularly worried about um, demand for office space long-term. And I think, you know, you should always be, you know, uh, plan for the, you know, plan for the best, hope for the, hope for the best, plan for the worst, right? So you have to it kind of address head on that there is a digital alternative to the office space, which is different than past recessions. We've always had this snapback of office demand um, as an economy comes back from a recession. I think this is a very different situation, but environment truly matters. And I think, you know, if you're a leasing team, instead of asking, what are you looking for in office space? You know, we need to change our thinking to, you know, how do you measure what a productive day for an employee looks like what actions should employees be taking to be successful 
And we need to be much closer partners and much more, uh, I think, involved in the environment of our tenants rather than um, kind of turning the keys over and saying, you know, a floor is what you get and you guys figure out the environment. I think commercial real estate as a whole is going to have to be much more data driven as a partner um, to provide insights to tenants on how the environment of the office truly drives productivity, employee performance, happiness, collaboration, the things that are important to tenants. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's no longer okay to say, like as, a, as an owner, you can't just say, well, that's my tenant's problem, right? When you think about the research from JLL, they're sort of 330, 300, right? Most companies spend 90% of their OPEX on their employees, wages and benefits and amenities and services. And so if you're a landlord, you know, you can you can certainly work with them on the 9% they typically spend on their rent, but isn't it a much better solution orientation and partner relationship if you focus on the 90% problem, which is the employees and helping them with their retention, helping them with their employee productivity. You know, it's, if you really want to be a partner to your tenant companies, that's the problem to, to solve. Your comment with the cafeterias and atomic habits is, um, uh, is a good one. When I was at Google, someone at Google must have read the book because they literally, I remember them coming through our micro kitchens and putting the, um, like the frosted, uh, like the frosted decals over the bottom of the beverage refrigerators and moving all the sodas onto the bottom shelf behind the frosted, uh, decal and moving all the waters, you know, up, up to the top. They took all the like the M&Ms and the you know the chocolates and whatever and put them into ceramic containers and they took all the dried fruits and the nuts and they put them into glass containers right so they're trying to really influence that that habit they shifted to serving salads with with breakfast right um, increasing the amount of seafood that was uh, that was out and decreasing the amount of fried foods and red meat they labeled all the foods with you know red yellow green so really a lot of signals in the environment that, that ultimately changed behavior because Google recognized that having a healthy workforce, people that are getting sick less often, people that are coming to work, um, you know, and in uh, and, and creating and producing is much more valuable to them than serving like the lower cost alternative to the to the food, right? So they're again they're using data to understand how they can impact consumer behavior, how they can impact employee behavior with uh with better food service and healthier you know healthier programs they apply that same they apply that same thinking to office design right how much collaborative space there is the distance between a desk and the micro kitchen um the duration of meetings uh and, and you know and, and all of the other physical space services and amenities that uh that they offer so uh so somebody must have read atomic habits and uh and, and applied it at the uh at the company for sure yeah. or the atomic habits author was actually studying google because they've yeah. been out in front of the workforce trends for a while but i think it's an important point where you think about you know as an employer you can't control the design and the layout of someone's home office, right? You can't control, I mean, I'm sitting in a room that I don't typically work in because uh, there are people doing construction outside the house. So you can't control for noise. Um, the mix of kind of work time, you know, everyone wants work-life balance and that's important. But in terms of you know, the, the environment at the office is you don't watch Netflix while you work, right? You can't control what the environment is for the home employee. And you don't hear a lot of employers talking about this because it's not particularly popular, right? Um, to say things like, you know, the, the work environment is important from a productivity standpoint, but it is. I mean, there are distractions at home that um, are very real. You can't program the day as easily uh, from the home office. I think there are a lot of things with regards to costs are gonna be pushed on to employees um, the more that they're expected to work from home and certain hidden ways. And then obviously interaction and collaboration, which are both kind of um, corporate happy buzzwords. So that's the, those are the things that uh, a lot of, I think large companies are focused on, you know, we want to drive collaboration. Um, people are afraid to talk about productivity uh, because I think it, it, it's a, it comes off as a little confrontation or 
with the employees. But it, it is something that I think we're going to see that the office has a lot of benefits from a from a productivity standpoint. And you know, tying it back to data here, like landlords have to understand. You know, they need to be in the business as as people are far, far more flexible and they can work in more places than before. You can't just hope that the employer finds that data on the office product. It's your product that you're selling. You have to be able to answer the question that we get from landlords all the time. How do you quantify ROI? Well, how do you quantify the ROI of an office space? You know, let's say we're paying a million dollars a year for our office. Can you, as the chief revenue officer of HQO, say that we drove a certain amount of sales because of the office space? Not today. It's tough, right? So, I mean, we we fundamentally believe uh, from a productivity standpoint in the value of the office space, but I think you know office owners for a really long time haven't had to ask, uh, answer the tough question of like quantify the ROI of the office, and it's a big expense item for a lot of companies, and now they're gonna. You know, obviously, in the in the short to medium term, they're going to run into some headwinds on you know companies looking to cut costs in a recession, which again is not new. The new dynamic of this is going to be, um, you know, how it, how it bounces back, right? And can you maintain productivity outside of the office? And I think that's where what what we're trying to build and what we're focused on with the digital grid is enabling pretty granular data on how people use the, the building, right? Not just at the shell of the building, which is typically how landlords um, think about, you know, we own the building and what happens, you know, essentially inside the, the sweet walls that's on the, on the tenant uh, and the employees, but how do we enable landlords to be as granular about the usage of their product as Spotify is with music, right? They know everything about your tastes, your likes, your dislikes, what engages you for you know, to listen to a full playlist rather than bail early, what keeps you coming back every day, what gets you to recommend stuff to other people. Um, and the office sector has to move in this direction, but the only way that they're gonna do it, and you mentioned working at Google, what we've seen in other industries like advertising and technology, First and foremost is you have to lay the groundwork of how you collect data in an organized fashion. So with our digital grid product, what we've done is we've created a data model that organizes pretty modularly, you know, all the different types of data on human behavior, how people use an asset. Because what we think is really important is there needs to be a model that can be used across buildings so you can start to get intelligence that is um, applicable to benchmark your building against other buildings in your portfolio or other buildings in your neighborhood or city, right? From a performance standpoint. So number one is you have to figure out what data should be collected and how to organize it. Number two is you have to start collecting. So when we think about the digital grid and what we've done is we have figured out ways to activate different elements of a building to collect meaningful and actionable data. So, you know, when you think about tenants coming back from quarantine or lockdown, one of the things that's going to be a powerful signal in terms of um, the importance of the office product are people actually coming back to the building which tenants have employees regularly coming back to use the product, right? So when you think about how you collect that data, um, you wanna be able to collect data off of access control systems, you wanna be able to collect data off of the elevator systems in terms of what floors people are going to. Ideally, you start to figure out data on what types of rooms and areas of office suites are um, being used. Are people using conference rooms? You know, that's probably an indication that in-person collaboration is really important, right? So you should be designing your product for that type of engagement, which we continually hear is one of the, you know, one of the prime reasons that people feel they need to keep an office. So again, when you think about the phases of becoming uh, data oriented is one, what's the model on how you collect and organize it? Two, how do you start to to collect it, and then three, the actionable piece of it is what what are the insights and intelligence, right? Data 
hunt that isn't organized um, and you can't you can't gather intelligence off of it's not particularly useful so with the digital grid it's actually a network of shared data so the the name is based off of and inspired from the electric grid which obviously figured out a standardized way to organize and share electricity across um, across buildings in an area right and we think really important for the future of commercial real estate is how you start to look at your data in comparison to your portfolio, but also in comparison to buildings that are near yours or like yours. So if you're a class A office owner in downtown Boston, you're gonna wanna know how are, how's my asset performing on one street compared to other assets that I might own? How's it comparing to other class A assets in downtown Boston? How's it comparing to other assets in the neighborhood, right? So when you think about how you differentiate and what the competitive advantage is, you know, just as I talked about with Spotify, without data and intelligence on how people use a product, what they like, what they don't like, um, moving forward, you're just not going to be able to differentiate without data. And this is something that compounds, right? The more you know about how people use your asset, particularly in the context of compared to the crowd, the more you're gonna be able to change the experience of the asset to continue to collect more data. So if you get out to a lead and becoming data driven on, on the user experience, it's going to compound on itself. Yeah, for sure. No, I think that's, I think that's great. And, you know, to sort of summarize, we get close to wrapping up here. I think the, the big message or the big takeaway is that the combination of data, right? Your system data, your suite stack data, your services and amenities stack data, user behavior and data but that combination is really powerful in driving value and if you're not combining those data sets today and and, and and decisioning off of that you're you're falling behind or you're already behind because of that notion of sort of compounding interest on your on your data right so as a as a next step for those who are interested in learning more we believe that you can't do any of this without a without a partner Right, Google uses lots of different partners to uh, put the frosted decals on, design the office space, provide the food services. That's not an entirely in-house, uh, in-house driven uh, process, even for a company at the size and scale of, uh, of, of Google. Um, so we believe you need a partner to do that. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about it, you can reach out to me or reach out to Chase. We'd be happy to tell you more about HQOS and the digital grid. Um, that data is what you're going to use to differentiate going forward and to really create value for your assets. Uh, value for long hold, value for asset acquisition or disposition, um, that's where uh, it, it's all going to be about the data, uh, the data equation. Circling back to where we started on QSR and McDonald's and Burger King, they are looking at data on the locations of their restaurants. They're looking at data about the traffic patterns and people coming in and out. They're looking at purchase behaviors and which menu items are selling and which aren't. They're looking at benchmark data across the market for their competitors, direct competitors like BK and Wendy's, as well as more broad market-based competitors like Chick-fil-A and Sweetly. Um, and those benchmarks and that data on their network is informing the decisions they make about future menu items, future locations, and 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 how they create value for uh, for their customers and for their shareholders. So uh, so with that, I'd like to really thank uh, thank you, Chase, for for joining. Thank everybody for uh, for watching, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the roundtable.